life. Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here with Marco Learning. And we just had a great little session on my channel and looks like some of y'all have followed me here. And actually some of y'all, uh, you know, that didn't follow me here that were already here at the Marco Learning channel. So let's go ahead and y'all uh, y'all get us into, uh, y'all get into the thing here. All right, so uh, now, come on, Rogue Bandit, I wouldn't say anything like that, but y'all go ahead and get your questions in here. Uh, now, note here that we've got a link up here, you know, which I didn't realize you could do this on a live, but you can click this uh, this thing right at the, uh, at the top there. Okay, you can pin a comment, and if you click on this link here, you can get free study guides for Marco Learning, okay? So they've got a complete set of study guides um, from, uh, you know, on the Supreme Court cases and the foundational documents. So if you click on that link, that is something that is going to be very, very helpful for you. Um, hey, hello, Aubrey, and uh, we've got Rogue Bandit here. Y'all go ahead and uh, get your questions in. Um, as far as that goes, I'll go ahead and start, uh, you know, looking at the, you know, go ahead and pick those up here. We've got the Supreme Court cases and the foundational documents. There were a few things, uh, you know, a few things that we were working on last time. I just lost those, okay? So how should you go about answering the FRQs, okay? So one of the things is that the FRQs, they're gonna be done all at one time, okay? So, you know, basically you're going to get 20, 40, 60, um, you're going to get, yeah, 100 minutes, okay? But uh, now note here, Although you get twice as much time for the argument essay, I want to note that you are actually going to, the argument essay does not count any more than the other sections, okay? So that's something that I think is worth noting, that the argument essay, even though it's a bigger task, it does not carry any more weight. So each of those sections are 12.5%. So the quantitative analysis, 12.5%. Argument essay, 12.5%. So that's something, uh, you know, something to note there. Um, but with that, make sure that you are answering the questions. Like you have plenty of time. This isn't like an AP history, um, you know, essay section where you're going to be pressed for time. One of the things that I see is people are, you know, they, they, they want to answer something in one sentence that they, they should really be using two or three sentences. So that's something that I think is uh, is very important there. So with that, let me go ahead and take some uh, some questions here. So Angelina, can we go over Brutus one? OK, so Brutus number one, this is a link to, uh, you know, this is a link to with Brutus number one. Wait, what was I saying? I was actually, uh, yeah, so Brutus number one, this is an anti-federalist, okay? And so anti-federalists, they're the ones who believe that the Constitution is dangerous and it should not pass. And so with Brutus number one, what you want to think about is all of the Federalist Papers are basically responding to it. Brutus is making an argument that the Constitution is neither federal nor Republican, okay? And so let's think about what that means, okay? Brutus is making a, you know, is making this, uh, you know, this, uh, this argument that the Constitution is not federal, meaning that it doesn't reserve any rights for the states. Now, remember that the Articles in Conf of Confederation and the Constitution, they both establish a federal system of government where you have a division of sovereign authority between a central government and state governments. Now, the Articles of Confederation, aside from foreign policy, you know, the uh, making of treaties, sending ambassadors, declaring war, army and navy, um, and a couple other things. But other than that, everything stayed with the states. Now, the Constitution also is a federal constitution, which means it does not set up a national government like you would have, for example, in France, where basically France has a national government and regional governments. But, you know, in the United States, we have the federal government and state government. So Brutus says this is going to set up a national government, like there's going to be, you know, nothing uh, left to the states. And he uses, he attacks the judiciary, okay? Because remember, the Articles did not have a federal judiciary. And so the Articles of Confederation didn't have a judicial system. And then all of a sudden, the Constitution does. Well, Brutus says that this is going to be a Trojan horse 
for uh, basically eviscerating the state courts, that the state courts are going to be nothing by the time the federal court system gets done with them, which if you're looking at that uh, from the, you know, from this century, you know, that, that might be true. But note that that's because of amendments. Without the 14th, like before the 14th Amendment, uh, you know, the state courts still had a lot more authority than they, than they do now with the process of selective incorporation. But Brutus really in some ways is kind of prophetic because Brutus says, look, this, uh, this judicial system, this is going to be a big deal. Whereas Hamilton in Federalist 78, now the Federalist, um, you know, the authors of the Federalist papers, Madison and Hamilton, um, they are you know, basically making an argument that the Constitution is both federal and Republican, that it leaves room for the states and it keeps the people in charge of the government. So Hamilton in Federalist number 78, he's responding to Brutus and Hamilton says, Psh, no, the judiciary, you don't have to be afraid of that. It's going to be the least dangerous branch. OK, so that's that's Hamilton in Federalist 78. And so Brutus um, says that the judiciary, the judiciary is going to be a big deal. Brutus also argues for small republics. Brutus says a Republican form of government can only exist in a small political community. You know, he's looking at the Roman Republic, for example. OK, so in a small political community, um, you know, you can have a Republican government. But as it gets bigger, there's no way for this government to be accountable to the people. Now. That's where Madison responds in Federalist 10. And he says, well, actually, a large republic is better. Want to know why? Because it limits the influence of political factions. OK, so, for example, I was uh, tutoring a client earlier who's in California. And if you look at the government in my state of South Carolina, which is heavily Republican, and his state of California, which is heavily Democratic, most of our states don't have, uh, you know, don't have a competitive party system. Like most of our states have, let's see, states with trifectas. Uh, a trifecta means that that is a state where all of the government, like the both branches of the, you know, both houses of the legislature and, uh, you know, and the governorship that they are in a, uh, you know, that they are in the same party's hands. And so South Carolina is a is a trifecta state. And so is California. Now, if we look here, I can actually, uh, let me see if I can, uh, you know, give y'all a little, uh, let's see if I even have that option. I'm on Zoom here. So yeah, it looks like I can't actually share my screen here. Let's see. All right. So with this state government trifecta, so when you look at this map here, this is a map with states where, um, you know, South Carolina has a Republican trifecta, a Republican governor, both houses of the legislature. So you see that, you know, almost half the states have Republican trifectas. Now then there, the Democrats have trifectas in several states as well. And so only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, and maybe about 12 to 13 states, okay? So about 75% of the states, we're about just looking at it, have trifecta. So, you know, Madison's arguing that in state governments, uh, in these small republics, one political faction um, controls the state at the expense of another. So he says a large republic is actually better because that is going to limit the influence of factions. It's more difficult to create a, um, you know, to create that kind of thing at the federal level. And when you look today, right now, the Democrats technically have, uh, you know, the presidency, the Senate and the House, but they have the Senate and the House both by the narrowest of margins. And so that's something where it's very rare that a party has a trifecta long term at the federal level. And so that is Madison responding to Brutus and saying that, you know, that's that's not the case. And that's why. Now, also, when uh, when Brutus says that this this government that now has the power to tax, it now has, uh, you know, it now has the power to control interstate commerce and so Madison in Federalist 51, he has to argue that like, look, yes, this government has been given more powers. But what we've done is we've created this system of separation of powers and checks and balances to where these branches will work against each other. 
Well, what if something happens and the branches aren't working against each other? Madison says, well, then you've got the states. That's one thing that is often forgotten about when it comes to Federalist 51, that, uh, you know, that Madison does mention federalism. In addition to checks and balances, federalism is another check and balance, that you've got the states on the other side of that. And so, so with that, um, then finally, we want to note like Federalist 70. Now that's Hamilton being Hamilton. In Federalist 70, uh, Hamilton has to, uh, you know, has to defend the idea of a unitary executive. Now our constitution at the constitutional convention, they thought maybe there should be an executive committee, but they decided on a unitary executive, one person in charge of the entire executive branch. And People are skeptical. That's a lot of power to give to somebody. You know, to have one person in charge of executing all the laws sounds awful lot like a king. Well, Hamilton says this really can't be avoided. You know, you have checks and balances between the branches, but the executive branch has no checks and balances within it because the, you know, because the executive branch needs energy, okay? It needs to have energy to run. And if you've got all kinds of debating and stuff like that, no good, okay? And so as far as that goes, fiscal policy and monetary policy, okay? And I've actually got a little video on this, um, but fiscal and monetary policy, that is uh, you know, basically fiscal policy, taxes and spending, okay? So remember that Congress gets to set the budget and specifically any kind of tax bills have to start in the House. That is like the only um, power that the House has. You know, they have the power to initiate revenue bills. And so taxes and spending, that has to do with fiscal policy. We think fiscal, that is the finances, okay? That's the checkbook. Now, monetary policy, that's having to do with the money supply, okay? And base, basically, monetary policy has been delegated to the Federal Reserve by the Congress, okay? So the Federal Reserve, um, you know, is the agent. Now, the Constitution gives Congress power over both fiscal and monetary policy. Um, but as far as that goes, when you look at your, uh, at your money, it says Federal Reserve Note, okay? So it says Federal Reserve Note, and that's because the Federal Reserve is the body created by Congress. It's one of those, uh, you know, independent agencies that, you know, basically regulates the money supply. They decide how much money is going to be printed. Um, they can expand or contract it. Now, the Federal Reserve also um, sets interest rates, okay? So that's what we have, uh, what we have there. And so with that, now, uh, you know, Ryan or Ryan with two N's, however we would do that. Traditionally, what unit does the AP exam focus on? Now, unit two, which is the one with uh, like the branches of government and the interactions between the branches. Let's see. So AP, let me just, uh, let me see what I've got here. Let me just look that up real quick. Make sure I'm giving you the best information on, um, you know, so uh Okay, so basically that unit gets uh, gets the largest. It's usually going to be about a third of the exam, at least, is going to be the interactions among the branches of government, okay? So that's going to be something, let's see what we've got here. Yeah, usually 25 to 36%, okay? So as far as that goes, the unit two, interactions among the branches of government. Um, that's going to be, uh, you know, the biggest one that's going to be followed by political participation. So remember, the first three units are the government units, and then you've got the politics unit that's really about, uh, you know, four and five that are politics units. But yeah, so unit two on uh, the interactions among the branches of government and unit five on political participation, those are the only two units that are guaranteed to be more than 20 percent of the exam. And in fact, uh, units three and four are guaranteed to be less than 20 percent. So, you know, political ideologies and beliefs, unit four, that could be as little as 10 percent of the exam. So, you know, based on precedence, um, you've got unit two, unit five, 
unit uh, unit one, unit three, and then unit four. Now there's a little bit of overlap. So conceivably you could have a situation where you know unit two and unit five are kind of about equal, where there could be a situation where there's a little bit more of unit four than unit three. So, but but I would say if you're wondering what do I focus on, unit two and unit five, those are going to be the big areas of, uh, of focus. Um, so with that, all right. So uh, yeah, categorical grants. Okay. So remember, grants come in, you know, two forms. You've got, uh, you know, categorical grants and uh, and block grants. So categorical grants increase the power of the uh, the federal government because it basically says that here is what this, you know, this is a specific thing versus a block grant, which is more general. So with that, like with a categorical grant, this money could be for school lunches, school construction, um, for teacher salaries or something like that. Whereas a block grant says, this is money that the states can spend for education. Okay, that's what, that's what you're seeing there. All right, and let's see, uh, let's see what we've got here. Yeah, hard money and soft money, how they affect like political action committees, okay? So when you look at like the McCain-Feingold bill, okay? So that was something like the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. They were trying to limit the use of soft money in campaigns. And what soft money is, soft money is basically when outside groups are spending money on politics, um, you know, on campaigns, whereas hard money is money that is spent by the campaigns themselves. And so it was an effort Effort to have more of the money that's spent in politics spent on, you know, spent by the campaigns. That basically the intent was that the, uh, you know, that the people, you know, the candidates are having to stand by what they, uh, you know, what they are, uh, you know, what they're saying rather than hiding behind an outside group. Now, so you had that, uh, you know, that bill, you know, that bill in 2002. Now in 2010, the Supreme Court comes out with Citizens United. Now here's where I would, you know, definitely encourage y'all to download these study guides. If you haven't already, I think these study guides are great. Okay. So when you look at this here, you've got, this is foundational documents and this is the Supreme Court case study guide pack, okay? So as far as that goes, we've got, you know, very quick, very good looking, efficient study guides that go into all of these cases. So if I go into here, I can search for Citizens United, okay? So Citizens United. Now this was a game changer because the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, otherwise known as McCain-Feingold, um, this was basically trying to limit the influence of salt money, uh, you know, things like the, the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, okay? In 2004, they made a bunch of ads that were very critical of John Kerry, the Democratic candidate for president. Now, George W. Bush's campaign, be like, we didn't, that wasn't us, okay? And now one thing, there's actually some good research on negative campaigning and negative advertising that says it's actually a good thing because it's the only way we learn about the candidates because when candidates um, put out like positive ads, they're like, oh, look at this candidate with their family and all that. And we don't actually learn anything about them or where they stand on the issues, but negative ads tend to put uh, put emphasis on that. So Citizens United, what happened here was, uh, you know, this group, uh, this interest group, Citizens United, when we think about the um, pluralist, uh, pluralist democracy. Okay. So if we think about the pluralist theory of democracy, this is where it is a contest between groups. Okay. Or as Madison would say in Federalist 10, factions. So in 2008, Citizens United, they just decided, huh, you know, this year, let's just, yeah, let's release it this year. We've made a work of art. We've made, we made a movie and it's called Hillary the movie. And so uh, so they release Hillary the movie, you know, they put money into it and they're like, we're going to make like a theatrical run with this thing. And so we want people to see Hillary the movie. And they would say, you know, we're just making a work of art. Well, what happened here was that, uh, you know, they were sued and it was like, okay, you are, this is intended to influence the election. This is not just a movie, a work of art about Hillary Clinton. And so this goes up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court is like, you know, at the end of the day, 
this is a First Amendment thing. So they declared part of the McCain-Feingold camp you know, bipartisan campaign reform act, they declared it unconstitutional. Because when you look at this, I mean, this is one of these things I want to stress that Citizens United is one of those decisions that nearly everybody is going to have some conflicts about, okay? Because for one thing, the amount of money that we spend on political campaigns in the United States, it's unfortunate. You know, there's a lot more money going in our campaigns, um, whereas in other countries, they have spending limits, or they even have like campaigning periods. You know, if you go to like, you know, the UK or to Canada, it's like the campaign's only going to last for about two months. Whereas here, uh, the campaign goes on for about 18 months before a presidential election. And it can get kind of overwhelming at times. But then again, the First Amendment to the Constitution, you know, that that is something that when I, you know, when I give money, um, you know, to, to somebody trying to influence an election, I'm speaking with that money. So, you know, basically the Supreme Court says that when an outside group is spending money to influence elections, you can't put a limit on that, uh, on what that group spends. As long as, now this is where we get the super PACs, okay? So the super PACs, what happens here is with the super PAC, it is, it is something that as long as they are not coordinating with the campaign at all. There can be absolutely no communication, like zero communication between the super PAC and the campaign. So the super PAC, you know, they are not affiliated with the campaign. And so therefore they don't have any limits um, to what they can spend. Now, if there is coordination, like a traditional PAC, a traditional political action committee, they actually have limits on what they can, you know, on what they can spend. Okay. So there are limits on what they can spend because they are coordinating with the campaign. They can say, they can call up the campaign and say, hey, we were thinking about doing this ad and we wanted to check the timing with your campaign, make sure this is on message and all of that kind of stuff. Um, now, one thing that you'll notice is some campaigns, like it's gotten aware, they'll put like high resolution photos of the candidate online so that super PACs can have access to high resolution photos of the candidate without actually having to contact the campaign. Um, there was one time a few years ago where some like super PAC, they developed a code to where they were putting like poll results on Twitter, but they weren't sending it to the campaign, but somebody at the campaign knew, check this Twitter account, we see the results of this, uh, of this internal polling. So they get really, really creative with it and sometimes they get busted. But, uh, but with that, now one place where the Citizens United upheld the, uh, you know, upheld the 2002 Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, um, one thing that they did is they upheld the requirement that all organizations that are seeking to influence election so that they disclose their donors. Now, that was actually, that part was eight to one. Clarence Thomas, and I think that he was a little bit ahead of his time. I think that's something that, especially if you look at our polarized climate today, Clarence Thomas said that, uh, you know, disclosing um, donor lists and stuff like that, that is something that's going to have a chilling effect on political speech because people are afraid, they're going to be afraid to give to certain campaigns because they're going to be afraid of harassment. And so Clarence Thomas, like he wrote a dissenting opinion saying that, uh, you know, that there shouldn't be the requirement to disclose because people should be able to give to this organization without having to fear consequences. So this is, uh, you know, this is basically about, uh, you know, groups, whether it be a corporation, a labor union, or, you know, what we call today a super PAC. So that's something. But again, the disclosure, the Supreme Court did uphold the disclosure provisions um, of the 2002 Act um, because they decided, you know, it's like people have a right to know where the money is, uh, where the money's coming from. Now, note that, you know, with the you know, with the spending, you know, limits, that was five to four. But again, eight to one vote saying that they're upholding the disclosure part of this. Okay. So going with, uh, you know, so going with that, uh, you know, so we've been over a little, uh, you know, little packs and super packs and that sort of thing. Um, so with that, I'm, um, you know, so with that now, and again, 
political polarization. So uh, the timestamp guy, you know, who's always, uh, you know, we always like having the timestamp guy in here, uh, that, uh, you know, the thing is political, political polarization is a reality. Like, I mean, when it comes down to it, we are living at a point, you know, when, when I was growing up, when I was your age, uh, you know, you still had like, you know, conservative Democrats and like liberal to, you know, liberal Republicans and that sort of thing. So in a in a period of low polarization, you don't see where, you know, there is the both parties are going to have like, you know, there's going to be kind of a middle and sort of an overlap. OK, so that's going to be something that we'll see in low polarization, whereas high polarization, you know, if somebody says they're a conservative, you're pretty sure that they're a Republican. Republican today, whereas that didn't necessarily, that wasn't necessarily the case like 30 or 40, certainly not like 50 years ago. So something to think there. So New York Times versus the United States. Um, so with that, New York Times versus the United States, and again, this is something that Marco Learning has these, uh, you know, has these beautiful review guides. So let's go ahead and just take a look at, uh, you know, at that Supreme Court case. And remember, you can just look for, um, you know, New York Times. Okay, so New York Times versus the United States. Uh, let's see, that was uh, Schenck versus the United States. Let's see, New York Times, is that, uh, yeah, New York Times versus the United States. And so basically, um, that what happened here is the New York Times got a hold of the Pentagon Papers. Now, the Pentagon Papers were leaked, uh, you know, were leaked by someone, okay? So basically, a government official, uh, you know, leaked these Pentagon Papers, which showed evidence that the U.S. government, the executive branch of the government especially, was lying to the American people about what was going on in Vietnam, that the American people were not getting, uh, you know, the right information there. And so, so with that, on um, the, you know, the Nixon administration, they tried to invoke executive privilege. Now, executive privilege is something that it, there are times when this can be granted, okay? So executive privilege, this is basically that there is, you know, there are some situations where the executive branch is able, you know, is entitled to discuss certain matters in public. So for example, if this had been like troop movements or this were, you know, a, you know, this were like a mission that's currently going on or something like that, then there can be executive privilege if there's a matter of national security. Um, but basically one of the words here you want to note for New York Times versus the United States is prior restraint. Okay, prior restraint is a form of, uh, you know, form of censorship where the government says like the new you know typically a newspaper before they print something sensitive they're going to consult the government officials and you know in question and prior restraint you know basically the nixon administration said you can't print that they are restraining it prior to it being printed so the new york times sued and the supreme court said nope that does not qualify for executive privilege because there, you know, when they went through the Pentagon Papers and what the New York Times was about to put out there, they said there is nothing there that puts our troops at risk. There is nothing there um, that endangers national security or anything like that. Um, you know, but there is stuff there that embarrasses government officials and shows the government's been lying to people. So that's something that, uh, yeah, prior restraint exactly. That's when you know they the government says. You can't print that. And again, they are putting that out there in, uh, you know, in advance of something. OK, so so going from uh, so going from there, let's see, um, you know, let me just uh, note here, Shaw versus Reno. Now, a couple things here. So Perla, um, let me note first the two kind of political cases. Um, you know, one of them, Baker versus Carr, that's the one person, one vote. Um, in Baker versus Carr, the way I remember Baker versus Carr, that if a baker's going to bake cookies, um, then, you know, the cookie should be the same size. OK, so the baker's going to sell the cookies for the same price. You know, the cookie should be the same size. Now, Wisconsin versus Yoder, that's one of my favorite. You know, um, May the 4th is coming up, right? Um, I always think, uh, you know, when I think about Wisconsin versus Yoder, I think about like Wisconsin versus Yoda. And, uh, Amish we are. Send our children to high school. We will not. Um, and so that's uh, that's typically I do there. Hey, Diego. All right. So I tell you what, tomorrow on AP, uh, AP government, go Diego, go. 
Vamos Diego, Vamos. All right. So, uh, so with that, let's uh, let's see here. So Shaw versus Reno. This is always an interesting one to go over here. So Shaw versus Reno. Um, this is basically, uh, you know, a group of voters um, challenged, uh, you know, Janet Reno, who was the um, you know, who was the uh, attorney general at the time. Basically, North Carolina at that time was still under the Voting Rights Act. And so what happened here was their districts had to be approved by the executive branch, like the Justice Department had to approve that. Now, in this case, uh, you know, this is a time when the Democrats are in control of the executive branch. This is during the Clinton administration. And so basically, Janet Reno's uh, Justice Department said that they looked at North Carolina's map and basically they said there was one majority minority district. And so they said you need to have a second majority minority district. And so what happened here was, uh, you know, North Carolina said, OK, well, we'll put a second majority minority district. How about this one? And so this is the map that got approved. And so, you know, now the thing is, the Supreme Court is a little bit wary of entering into political questions, okay? The Supreme Court tries to stay out of something that would be named like a political question. So they tend to be cautious, but in this case, so the case was like, look, is this okay? Now, the Supreme Court, to a certain extent, now note that there's nothing unconstitutional about gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is just what is. Um, one of the things about this course, this course is not about government as it should be. It's about government as it is, okay? When we think about government as it, sh government as it should be, we would just kind of roll the dice and you have some things that make sense. Now, the Supreme Court, they don't have a problem with this district here. They don't have a problem with this district here. I mean, these districts gerrymander and crawl all over the place, okay? They don't make any sense at all, except that they're trying to manipulate the map to, uh, to, to benefit one party or another. Now, so this one, this one's okay. That's a gerrymander. But then, like, look at this gerrymander. Now, remember, gerrymander, it is a combination of the words Elbridge Jerry, who was, like, the guy that drew the districts in Massachusetts way back in the day, and Salamander. So each of these districts are like, oh, look at that little gerrymander, okay? Look at that little gerrymander kind of, like, slithering around there in that state. Now, the Supreme Court is looking at this one, and they're saying, like, okay, this is a problem, okay? They're like, we'll let this, you know, this is up to the states because remember, the state is ultimately in charge of the, you know, of the drawing of the districts. And so the Supreme Court doesn't want to get too involved with that. But the issue is that we can kind of look the other way here, but this there is no other reason for this district to be drawn the way it's drawn um, other than like, okay, we made another majority minority district. There is absolutely no reason for this particular gerrymander to exist other than race, okay? And so what we see here, and this is actually very similar to how the federal courts handle affirmative action programs, okay? There is a case, Regents of California versus Bakke, or Bakke versus the Board of Regents, yeah, I think, but I forget which, which side that was. But, um, you know, basically what happened was Bakke didn't get into the University of uh, California Medical School because they had a quota. They said that we are going to have exactly this many minorities. Um, and so, you know, with that, the Supreme Court said, you can't do that, okay? You can't say that we have a quota system and we're letting in exactly this many minorities. Um, but what they can do, the Supreme Court ruled that universities certainly can, they can consider race and ethnicity and the diversity of the student body when they're making admissions decisions. But they can't say that we are going to have this many non-white students exactly that are going to be admitted, um, you know, without regard to other qualifications. So in a very similar kind of decision here, the Supreme Court ruled that you can have majority minority districts, okay, that, that there is no problem with that. And in fact, that can be in some cases, uh, you know, that can be beneficial because otherwise, uh, you know, like black residents of a state may not have somebody, um, you know, to represent them. So it's something that can work well, but sometimes majority minority districts, they're used to like in a state like mine, they make it very heavily democratic. Um, let's see. 
South Carolina congressional districts, for example, um, that you see basically in the upstate, they tend to be pretty straightforward. Like four of South Carolina's districts are very straightforward. But when you see this sixth congressional district, this is our majority minority district. And you see where, oh, let's bring this up here and let's bring this around here kind of thing. But note that it's still for the most part, like you can kind of look the other way there, even though you can see clearly this is an attempt to create a majority minority district. But as long as it's not the only consideration, then that's fine. OK, so so with that, um, so we see from 2023, OK, they've got a little bit. OK, so they finished. Oh, that's interesting. So they're going to make these districts just a little bit different, but not like you know, not fundamentally different, but that just, that looks a little weird. I think I'm just used to looking at the other one. Okay. So that's what it was. And then we see here that they've, uh, they've made a few little amendments there, but left most of the map pretty much, uh, pretty much untouched, but, you know, have added a little bit there to the first district and the sixth district's got a little bit different of a composition there. So what you notice here is you've got here, you've got R plus seven, R plus nine, R plus 21, that's my district, um, you know, then R plus 14, R plus 11, and then D plus 17, R plus 11. Now note here, D plus 17, um, this basically puts a lot of Democrats in a district together and ensures that all of the, re like five of the seven districts are pretty much guaranteed to be Republican at all times. Whereas, you know, this one here in a Democratic wave year can go Democratic, but usually it's going to be Republican. So typically you're going to see six out of seven districts Republican, whereas Joe Biden, President Biden got uh, like 43% of the vote in this state uh, in 2020. So, you know, South Carolina is, you know, is at least 40% Democratic, but that is not reflected in the representation. Now, note here, um, this is not, you know, the province of one party. This is something that, you know, happens in any state where the, the majority party is drawing the map. So, you know, Democratic states have largely Democratic delegations. Republican states have largely Republican delegations. So as far as, uh, you know, as far as that goes, uh, let's see, uh, let's see here. Um, so, so we see here, let's see if we've got any, uh, you know, just a few kind of last minute uh, questions uh, here. And, uh, you know, can't, so they can't, yeah, the thing is now remember, and again, they can group whatever they can group together as long as the two things when we think about Baker versus Carr, the districts have to have about the same number of people. Okay, so so the you can't say that we're going to have like 400,000 people in this district and 800,000 people in this district. That would be a violation of the ruling Baker versus Carr. The districts have to be the same size. And while gerrymandering, and again, gerrymandering is not is not unconstitutional. It's just a political fact, a reality, and that's that's why we're here. Not government as it should be, but government as it is. And so, uh, so with that, and yes, Tennessee had not redrawn in a long time. Okay, so yeah. So now the thing is that um, you know, Mossy, no other court cases will pop up. But one thing to note here is in your argument essay, if there is a case that you're familiar with that is not in one of the 15, you can use it. OK, so, for example, like Brown v. Board is on the 15, Plessy versus Ferguson is not one of the 15. You could use Plessy if there's a way that, you know, if there's some reason where you think like, you know, Plessy v. Ferguson or something like that could be used. Or I mentioned, uh, you know, Bakke versus the Board of Regents. I think it's Board of Regents versus Bakke. Um, you know, let me just make sure about that. Um, Bakke versus Cal. Yeah, so it's actually Regents versus Bakke, but sometimes people say Bakke versus California. So, you know, the thing is, is I've just been talking about that. I could use that in my argument essay. So that's something uh, something we can note there. Um, so with that, when it comes to, to the bureaucracy, Hope, what we want to note here is the bureaucracy, even though we say, OK, we've got these branches of government, uh, you know, these three branches of government, sometimes the bureaucracy can kind of be seen as the fourth branch. The bureaucracy has like 
they have you know leeway in enforcement so one thing you can think of when you think about the speed limit for example um if the cop pulls you over for going two or three miles over the speed limit you're gonna think come on now now the thing is though you were breaking the law the speed excuse me the speed limit said 55 you were going 57 but uh you know at the same time this is something that is, uh, you know, that you were breaking the law, but we have grown accustomed to there being, uh, you know, there being some exceptions being made there. So, so there are some times where the enforcers can either look the other way or they can, uh, you know, they can get really, really, uh, you know, adamant about enforcing. Now, one thing that we've seen, uh, you know, also, you know, when you think about, uh, you know, most recently, um, you know, when you see that uh, that's that court, uh, you know, that ju that judgment against like the CDC a week or two ago, where basically, uh, you know, the judge ruled that the CDC had gone beyond its rulemaking authority uh, when it came to, uh, you know, when it came to mask mandates, that basically that that is something that no, uh, you know, no law was ever made, but the CDC has said, well, you have to do this. So with that, uh, you know, we think about the bureaucracy, sometimes there are calls made by executive branch, you know, people in the executive branch that are in the bureaucracy that are not, uh, you know, they're not legislated. Now we'll see, I mean, I think there's an appeal on that and we'll see how that goes going up to the Supreme Court. So we wanna note also that when you think about like the bureaucracy, that it protects, government employees from political interference. So basically the president um, will, uh, you know, will appoint people who are in the top positions, okay? But when we think about the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy, these are people who are like in the middle management doing government jobs and they're basically career people. And so that, you know, with the bureaucracy, we have a, um, you know, a career, uh, you know, people who are pursuing a career. Um, and so they don't, uh, yeah, rule by the desk, okay? And so one thing, um, okay, let me just, uh, let me just run in here real quick here, um, because sometimes when bureaucracies come up, I think that it's, uh, you know, we always run into the iron triangle, okay? So let's just run over the iron triangle real quick there. But yeah, a lot of a lot of things that we, you know, a lot of policies that are passed and that sort of thing, it's like they they do things without, uh, you know, without consulting. Now, they do have a certain amount of rulemaking authority. And so that's the thing. There is a certain amount, like the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, does not have to ask Congress every time it uh, issues um, some type of ruling or something like that. But they have certain boundaries that are kind of understood that they'll stay within. So the Iron Triangle, basically, when you look at Congress, the bureaucracy, and an interest group, okay? So, you know, and you think about this, I'll, uh, you know, self-deprecate here a little bit, teachers, okay? So you think about, like, teachers that we, you know, like, let's say that, uh, you know, Congress, you know, they get, uh, somebody runs for Congress, they have the support of, uh, they have the support of teachers, and so when they have the support of teachers, then they are expected when they go in there that they will, you know, they will pass legislation that is friendly, uh, you know, friendly to teachers. Now, also, when you think about the people who get, uh, you know, get appointed in top positions. Um, so that's something where, you know, President Biden, who has the support of teachers unions, he would be expected to put people in those top positions that are going to be friendly to the teachers unions. OK, whereas President Trump, who did not have the support of the teachers unions, he put somebody, you know, with who definitely did not have the support of the teachers unions. So basically what happens there is in return for political support, then, you know, there is this kind of, you know, because the bureaucracy, um, you know, these are people who now the Hatch Act says that they can't really get involved directly in politics, but, you know, they can vote. And so that's something they expect things back. Okay, so this interaction between interest groups, Congress, and the bureaucracy that, uh, you know, when they get there, they're expected to, uh, you know, dance with the one that brung them um, for, uh, you know, for example. Um, so, so with this, let's see. So, um, so going there, let's see. So discretionary spending, yes. So when we're thinking about, uh, you know, mandatory versus discretionary spending, 
the military, I can say we're spending X amount on the military. That's going to be our budget for the military. And there you go. Um, whereas Social Security, I mean, if I were to, uh, you know, if I were just to, uh, you know, be walking down the stairs tomorrow and fall and break my neck and I'm disabled, like that was not a budgeted item that basically I will qualify for Social Security benefits. OK, so if that were to happen to me um, that I were, you know, I'm going to knock on the wood here, um, but I would qualify for Social Security benefits. And so they can't budget that uh, if somebody turns 65 they meet the criteria that's what they're getting now the other thing i've got a video about civil rights and civil liberties basically with civil rights or civil liberties what you want to think about is you know civil rights do i have the same rights that everyone else has okay civil liberties am i getting my constitutional rights so as far as court cases civil rights we want to think about that synonymous with the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment Brown v. Board, okay, that is a civil rights case. Whereas cases like Gideon versus Wainwright um, and McDonald versus Chicago, those are civil liberties cases. That means, do I have the rights that are guaranteed to me by the US Constitution? And so that's what we're looking at with civil rights and civil liberties. The big question is, you know, is it a due process thing? So when we think about civil liberties, if I think my civil liberties have been taken away, I'm usually making a due process case that says that, you know, my right to an attorney or my right to bear arms or another right has been taken from me on account of that. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to, uh, you know, I want to, uh, you know, wish everybody the best of luck tomorrow. Um, I don't know if John's planning on coming here and saying hello, maybe bringing Marco on screen um, for just a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure, you know, sitting around here and, uh, you know, chatting with y'all and getting ready for your exam. So just, uh, you know, go into the exam with confidence. I mean, at this point, uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, you've pretty much done all you can. I would say at some point you want to go to bed. OK, that's something. Make sure you get a good night's sleep. I think that that is extremely important to get a good night's sleep. Um, so let's make sure that we're, uh, you know, that we're doing that. So, uh, you know, make sure to get a good night's sleep. And again, um, I would tomorrow before you go into the test, you know, make sure that you were going to, you know, do like uh, the four Federalist Papers. Make sure you've got those not confused, because remember on the argument essay, it's just going to have the number and that's going to be it. It's just going to have the number and that's all. All right. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for. Hey, Marco. Is. And you know that he's the only this is the only stream today where Marco made a proper regular appearance in front of his fans. So this is your therapy. This is your assignment tonight. Spend some time looking into these eyes, the eyes of someone who just got a one on the AP Gov exam. You can outperform this. <laughs> best of luck to you all. Get some rest and best of luck to you. Um, be in touch with us on social media. <laughs> That was, there he is. You know what I'm going to do too, Tom? This is a special hey, dog. treat. I'm going to brace yourselves, everyone. Oh. Very rare appearance of Nina. Oh, Nina. Mark of kid sister. <laughs> oh, wow. Here we go. Hey, Nina. Oh, she's not used to this. She's not, this Nina doesn't even have a, her own Instagram account or anything. She's not, she's, Nina. <laughs> oh my goodness she's not feeling it but that's a rare appearance too wow so y'all gotten both of the dogs that is uh yeah so that is yeah y'all make sure to manifest those fives okay so if yeah if john had five dogs then you could make a five you know those five dogs together only got make two. A five on the exam they're going to be manifesting twos anyway tom it was great seeing you thank you everyone best